Nice to see you again, Mike. Nice, nice to see you again. Although you're not in my screen in front of me right now, just so you know, so I have to turn around. Uh, Marty, I want to start with, we just talked about digital currencies. And again, you've been on top of that push, on top of the World Economic Forum push for the digital currencies, uh, you know, from the get-go. But I also feel that you have a slightly different take about how it would take place, for example, in the U.S. Yes, uh, you have to understand what they did with COVID um, was a test run. And what I mean by that is that in the United States, we have these what people think are constitutional rights. They're not. Uh, it, the Supreme Court held a long time ago that the Constitution is negative. It's not positive. Therefore, if you really looked at the First Amendment, it says the government shall not. All right. So they figured out if they just go to big tech and say, hey, you know, deplatform this guy, censor this, whatever. You have no actual constitutional right to, to free speech. That's a real misnomer. So the private sector could take that away from you. The government cannot, but the private sector can. So with these digital currencies, they're pulling the same scheme. The Fed will not issue a central bank digital currency because they would then have to go get a search warrant to check you and et cetera. So what they're doing is the top five banks are all quietly behind the curtain um, playing for their own little digital currencies, which will then be regulated by the Fed. All right. So then what happens is under the banking rules already, they are required to report anything that looks suspicious. So they're just dovetailing it all into what's there already. So the 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 set, you know the, the whatever bank you have, oh you know we think Mike Campbell might have done something you know sinister with Martin Armstrong. You better take a look at this. They don't need a search warrant to look at that. You know those records or whatever they're looking at is suddenly just handed to the government. So there's no constitutional rights of, you know involved. That's what they're really planning with this. It's it's because. Honestly, I, I, I said, you know, I've, for over 40 years, I've been dealing with governments and the way they look at it, we are the enemy. They always basically say uh, they wouldn't have a problem if everybody paid the taxes that they think we owe. You know, you pick up a hundred dollar bill you found in the parking lot. Where's our 50 percent? Uh, you paid the 16-year-old girl next door to watch the kids while you and your wife go out. Oh, my God. She got cash. She didn't pay taxes. You know, Th This is what they're doing. So the whole digital currency thing is to eliminate physical money. And they think that will eliminate the underground economy. Mm -hmm. And their tax revenue is going to increase by 35%. And that's their conservative estimate. So they want absolute total control. And, um, I mean, you know, I'm a kind of a history buff, and I can tell you one thing. Once you hand power to anybody, they always want more. Kind of a history buff? Okay. <laughs> Marty's encyclopedic when it comes to the history, especially financial history. Let me uh, dovetail on that and go to dollar, uh, de-dollarization. You know, you've written, you can go to Martin Armstrong, go to the bar, armstrongeconomics.com. He's written a report on this. And obviously a key subject going forward. But just give me a you know the nutshell on de-dollarization. Is it going to happen? Is it inevitable? You know what's what's up with that? Uh, well, <clears throat> this trend began when they put the sanctions in on Russia, because what happened was I mean even when Russia went into Crimea, Obama went to Swift and said remove them, and they refused. So they changed the, the head of the SWIFT system in 2019, and now he does whatever they want. So the problem is that divided the world economy. So suddenly China starts saying, well, they could do that to us. So they developed their own system, a chip system. Even Iran is developing something. So you've now divided the world economy. And that's where some people are saying, oh, the BRICS versus this. And, you know, you get these... Um, 
you know, nonsense, you know, theory, oh, you know, merchants are going to be backed by gold or whatever. Um, no, sorry, they're not, <laughs> you know. Uh, and you can't, people don't understand that you can't go to a gold standard without changing the politics. Uh, because then how is a politician going to run and say, vote for me and I'll give you X, Y, and Z? They can't, all right? They have to have that uh, ability to print money for things that they didn't collect or you know, promises. So the, the bricks basically are not going to have something like that, but we're looking at the division of the world economy. But what makes the dollar the reserve currency begin with? Most people don't understand that. It is the people. All right. The U.S. has the biggest consumer based economy. Germany, for example, followed the old mercantile system. We just build BMWs and Mercedes and sell them to everybody else. So if you look at the stats on the average German has less of a net worth than Italian. So the U.S. model is what rebuilt the world. Japan wanted to sell Toyota. Germany needed to do this. I mean, so everybody's been trying to sell to the American consumer, consumer all the time. That's what makes the dollar the reserve currency. All right, the same thing that British pound was reserve currency at back then as well. All right, before World War One. So the you know the de-dollarization is really kind of a, a you know I don't know just a conspiracy theory that these people were talking about. Uh, you. Those economies, if they refuse to take dollars, they're cutting off, you know, all their lifeblood. They wouldn't be able to sell anything to the United States again. Uh, so it's, you know, it's not that, you know, currency has to be fixed or something like that. Those things just don't work anyhow. Uh, I mean, we need a political reform, and without the political reform, Forget any idea of a gold standard, you know, eliminating deficits or anything of that nature. It's just not going to be possible. Let me ask about the sovereign debt issues of global, of course, but in the United States, uh, you watch the amazing bills, at least amazing to me, the, the amount of debt that was taken on in the last short while. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about that, how it could resolve. I mean, they're obviously going to have this huge, uh, you know, bond issue coming up. You know, the demand for dollars seems to be entrenched in the system, whether it's your foreign power, whether you're, uh, you know, domestic. It just seems there's a huge entrenched demand for U.S. dollars. Well, you know, part of the whole thing about um, this de-dollarization, which is, is kind of asinine in many ways, uh, just look at all the third world countries. If they want to raise money and for a sovereign debt, it's issued in dollars. They have to go to New York to float it, all right? Um, you know, you're not going to reverse that until you get some other major financial center that says, okay, fine, we're going to lend you whatever in, in Zimbabwe, you know, dollars or whatever. You know, it's, it, it's, it's much more. It has nothing to really do with the government per se, all right? It has to do with um, the financial depth of the market. Uh, this is why when when they were forming the euro, I warned them it's not going to work because they were not consolidating the debt. So as a fund manager, and if I wanted to buy euro debt, I have to still consider the credit rating of each and every member so that you see, you know, the rates are better for Germany versus Italian. It's a, you know, uh, it was never a national debt per se. So. The sovereign debt crisis is the problem uh, emerges when you try to sell new debt and nobody buys it. Then you can't pay off the old. That's when governments collapse. Um, so what they're going to do this time and why they need war, I personally think, is that uh, once you start war with China or anybody else, they just renege on all the debt. They won't pay it. Um, now, they can't do that on domestic debt that pension funds are involved in, etc. I mean, you're going to have people storming the White House with pitchforks, you know. Um, 
but they could easily go ahead and default on any country that's an enemy. And of course, people may not appreciate to the degree that's happened in the past. That wasn't the U.S. Maybe the U.K. had a moratorium, you know, uh, going back, but everybody else defaulted on the debt, you know, as we came through the 30s. Yeah, that was the 31. If you go back even further to the 1840s, uh, that's when uh, Andrew Jackson shut down the Bank of the United States, and then there was no uh, central bank. So all these banks started issuing their own money. And as they were going bust, then the states tried to bail them out, then the states went bust. Uh, so I mean, you had a, a sovereign debt crisis in the 1840s, but is at the state level. One of the uh, things that I've been saying for a number of years, though, is that, you know, uh, I did to start off this conference is that government isn't going to rescue from the variety of problems we have. So you're on your own. So that's the biggest concern I feel with people is that they look and say, well, how do I protect myself? Uh, what kinds of things? So one of the things, and I'm just going to go through a list with you, but one of the things that you had been warning about uh, for a number of years is you don't want to own government related debt that's of any kind of length, any kind of maturity going out, that you, you want to avoid that. So I want to your latest on that. Yes, you have to stay short term. I mean, that's what basically started taking down like a couple banks because they were long term and as rates go up, your long term debt uh, depreciates dramatically. Um, but you also have to keep in mind here that it's uh, when a government is financially in trouble, anything goes. Uh, Italy, uh, people thought they were smart. They had only 30 day, 90 day paper because they didn't trust the government long term. So what they did, they ended up saying, oh, okay, fine. Your 30 day paper now is 10 years. <laughs> so they didn't default, you know, they just extended maturity. That's so, what I mean, I, so I was there in Vancouver. I forget which politician you have. There's a, uh, a woman there. I couldn't believe that she actually said that everything really belongs to, to the government. And they decide how much you're allowed to keep. Oh, the, uh, we have name, a, I might remember her name. I don't yeah, remember her yes, name. I do. We have a name for that. It's called the NDP. Uh, uh, well, there certainly is. That's one of the big distinctions, uh, joking aside, that there are certainly people who believe in much more, you know, much bigger government, which we're experiencing now, and the confiscation of wealth. And on another side, you have people who believe it's your money and you decide with the government how much you're going to give them, not how much they're going to allow you to have. Uh, further to that, uh, last night you're talking about why we should care about geopolitical events, and there are so many to keep aware of. But one of the things that you've been writing about for a number of years is that every one of those geopolitical events assures more strength in the U.S. dollar because there's only really one game in town when it hits the fan. And that seems to be a continued trend. We've seen a lot of people preaching, uh, sorry, forecasting the demise of the dollar only to have the dollar regain strength, you know, in light of these geopolitical conflicts. Well, unfortunately, you have a lot of these people who um, keep beating on the dollar and, you know, they just look at the Fed all the time. They never look outside the country. I mean, you look at Europe, it's far worse than, than anything you see here in North America. Uh, they went to negative interest rates in 2014 and left them there for nine years. Um, and then interest rates start going up. I can tell you that virtually every bank in Europe has got a very serious problem. Is if they really had the mark to market the, their debt just like that SVB bank in California went down, uh, they'd all close. Yeah, I just want to make sure. So people... you have to really keep that in mind. It's, it's um, uh, you know, I reiterate, you know, stay away from government debt, uh, particularly the state and local level, um, because, you know, it's, they're the ones that end up being defaulted on first, anyhow. Uh, and, you see this uh, as we're, you know, uh, I guess I can bring in a little bit of, re of real estate. Um, I have warned that the real estate in the big cities would start declining. And then what you see is really a great migration 
So, um, like Florida, I mean, Goldman Sachs has moved with its most profitable division. Citadel from Chicago moved here. Uh, uh, BlackRock moved here. I mean, it, it, Florida is becoming the new Wall Street. Nobody wants to talk about it, but uh, that's what's happening. Uh, that everybody's kind of moving down here. I mean, uh, people ask me how why I moved, you know, seven years ago, and I told them, you know, my father's old wall partner told me to tell my family if I died while I lived in New Jersey to drive my body across the river before they told anybody. I mean, it's you end up paying half your life in, in taxes, then they want the other half if you die. It's just crazy. Uh, let's go further with, uh, so your forecast for the U.S. dollar, what are you seeing there? Uh, I still see it basically under pressure towards the upside uh, going into most likely around 2028. And again, keep in mind that as war begins to develop, then more and more capital is going to concentrate into the United States. And coming from basically Taiwan, you're looking at uh, Japan, uh, Europe, uh, even the Middle East. Uh, they just you know, need a place to park their money. Uh, and, and that's really what we're looking at. That's the same thing, the same pattern that happened for World War I, World War II. Um, uh, you know, the Suez Canal crisis. Uh, the only time the dollar went down was when it was the Cuban Missile Crisis, because then the, the, the problem might be here. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's pretty much no choice but to diversify if you're an international uh, investor. And, and, of course, there in Canada, at least you understand currency movements more than the average American does. Uh, so um, I think that's part of the problem with all these domestic analysts. They only look at the Federal Reserve and, and they don't really look at even Canada, honestly. Let me ask about the Canadian dollar. Um, any forecast for the Canadian dollar? Uh, yeah, look, your re your resistance is starts around the seventy seven twenty area, up to about eighty three thirty. Your support is at the seventy three thirty down to uh, really uh, seventy one and sixty three. I mean, it's Canada will still benefit from the capital inflows from everywhere else as well. All right, so uh, you're not looking at Canada falling out of bed so much like the euro. Uh, but just understand that we're looking at international capital flows here. And so if, if you do understand, just pay attention to the, uh, you know, the geopolitical events that are going on. And then you'll see how the capital actually responds. And it will just come over here. But it appears to be largely going into more of the domestic um, sector, uh, private sector. And as I said, you know, take a look at mainly, um, I would say, the Dow. When the Dow leads, that's a great indicator of foreign capital coming in. Let me uh, stay with Canada just for a second, because I want to remind people that we asked Marty to produce a Canadian report for our conference here, and he's done that. And uh, I would uh, invite you to take advantage of it. It looks broadly in how his models impact things specifically in Canada, including his broad model, the economic confidence model, what major dates, what turning points we're getting to. So I just want to, before I forget, I want to make sure you know that there is a Canadian report. And Vicky Martin's... Uh, daughter is in the corner over there and uh, but I, well, Vicky's always so nice to me by the way so I said for people who came to the conference can we get a discount so there's a little discount code of 50 percent so I'll give you more details on that but I just want to make sure I noted that before we got too short on time that talks about a ton of things and uh, some of the things that we're hitting on now for for our country I think you'll find it fascinating uh, Marty, uh, when we, there's so many factors that go into a currency. You've just related to one that I don't think people pay near enough attention to, which is geopolitics. But for us also, we're always concerned about what oil prices are doing. And we've had a bit of a, uh, certainly an up move, but a roller coaster. So uh, just your, your take on oil and, and how all of this sort of um, dovetails. Marty, every time Marty does a, a 
it's uh, like it would be a commodity or something like oil. He does it as an individual. And only after that does he look and say, oh, look at how that chart lined up with this chart and that chart lined up. It's all done individually. And that's where it gets powerful when you see they have the certain, same sort of turn dates or the same sort of peaks, that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, given that audience, uh, let's talk a little bit about the oil. Um, oil is a little soft, short term. Uh, talking about how things are lining up. Uh, September is showing up as a is what we call a high volatility target. Uh, and it's showing up across the board. In the Dow, it's uh, it's in the Canadian uh, TSX, it's in oil, um, and the I think you're you know those people that think oh you're going to eliminate oil, no way, it's just not going to happen. Um, uh, long term, you're looking at oil going uh, up to you know, new record highs before we hit 2032. Um, it, your major support there is down around the 48 level uh, to 42. Uh, your resistance, you know, is way up there at at really about 125, uh, and you're looking at initial support around 64. But um, my concern is that the way everything seems to be lining up, we could see geopolitical events this summer. As soon as June, uh, July doesn't, you know, looks to be a very uh, major target in many different things. And then we have this, like, what we call panic cycle in September. But it's showing up in many things, not just one. So that tends to suggest to me we're not dealing with an isolated shortage event or something like that. When it's showing up in oil and currencies and, uh, and uh, gold and many things, it looks as though we're going to get uh, what I call a false move first. And that false move may bring things down, even gold, for example, and then people say, oh, that's it. It's never going to go up. And it needs to make that false move kind of like a spring. You, you compress it, and then when you release it, it goes up even more. Um, that's what we're really looking at most likely from 25 on. So 24 may be more of this uh, concession, uh, consolidation, and pressure uh, towards the downside for support. Uh, even, you know, you're looking at uh, silver, which is trading at about 2280 or so, uh, your major um, support there uh, is is really down. It starts around 2140 and goes down to about 19. Uh, after that, uh, it drops down sharply to 13. Uh, resistance there is like around... Um, 46 and eventually we probably would see by the time we get to 2032 even maybe 54 dollars um so you know and keep in mind that what we're looking at here when i say like 54 dollars uh it also depends on what is the currency worth all right so the currency is moving at the same time so um I think you're going to be looking at um, 20, 24 as a false move type year. Be careful at the end, you know, of the summer. We might get a, a temporary crash at that point in time. But I think you're going to see those, those are going to be buying opportunities uh, because the computer is basically showing, as, as I said, you, you compress a spring. And when you take your hand off, it, you know, it pops out. And I think that's what we're looking for from 25 on. And that's pretty much uh, it uh, on most of these markets. Um, and I put it, a lot of specific numbers in the Canadian report for you. But um, uh, crude oil, like I said, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's not going away anytime soon. 
uh, you were looking at a, a fairly sizable rally uh, thereafter. I think you know the uh, um, even the Dow. We're looking at uh, ultimately by twenty thirty two. You're probably going to see it around fifty six to sixty thousand. Um, you know, but that you got to take into consideration the depreciation of the, of the real purchasing power in the dollar by that time. Uh, so it's a little bit more complicated, but um, everything is is pretty much. Yeah, we have a, a major panic cycle for a high volatility in the U.S. dollar by 27. I think the whole financial system is going to be under a lot of stress, 27, 28. I can't let you go without talking more specifically about gold. A lot of people here are interested in that subject. They let me know. So, again, it'll be what's so interesting, as I said, looking at the markets individually, then you look over this and they start pointing out the same kind of dates, the same kind of things. And it obviously adds to the validity of the, the model. Uh, Marty, so let's talk gold to finish off. Uh, gold is basically, uh, it looks as though that should make a retest of support in 2024. Um, maybe fake out people think, oh, that's it, never going up or whatever. Uh, your major supports down at like around 1650, 1670 area. Um, but it, it looks as though by the time you get to 27, minimum projections are uh, around the 24,000, 27, or 2400 to 27 area. And that's conservative. Okay. Um, so I would say, the, you know, again, we have this prospect of a retest of support, then um, we're gonna fake move to the downside. And then you always need that false move just before a market takes off. And uh, you, you can Google that on our site. I've, I've listed many and I've shown charts of false moves and how they, they, they function. They have to get the vast majority of people think they're wrong. And then, then when they are, that's when it goes up. Right. So, um, it, I mean, it's the same thing you've had with uh, all this stuff. I mean, you had people calling for a crash in the in the U.S. stock market, you know, for 23. They missed that. That was wrong. Then they're back at it again, you know. And as soon as it goes down a little bit, you'll say, see, I was right. Um, but it's interesting looking at the way people played it. Because you had a lot of people calling for a crash in 23, they kept shorting the market. So the market would be driven back up by short covering. Um, and like I said, when I got called into the 87 crash by the Brady Commission, um, it was clear they did not understand. All right. I got, they wanted to know why people were selling. And they put academics in charge that have never traded anything. And um, I explained to this guy, I, I said, oh, we're going to find the person that shorted the market went down. I said, do you understand how markets function? And he goes, well, I teach finance at one of the major, you know, universities. I said, that's very nice. I said, I actually manage about three trillion. All right. So um, I explained to him, I said, look, you've never been in the market. Everybody's long. You try to sell, but something's happened. You go to sell, and what's the broker say? No bid. When there's no bid, it goes down a thousand points in the blink of an eye. All right. It's not that somebody is shorted it and pushed it down. It's so many people trying to get out, and there's no bid. All right. And the same thing happens on the on the reverse. So when you get everybody, you know, trying to short the market. It's the short players that could get stopped out or taking it up. So expect that this year. All right. There'll be a lot of shorts building up on a lot of these different markets expecting a false move to the downside. All right. And as I said, it looks as though from July to September, it looks like, uh, honestly, a real chaos Jeez, in the most markets. So it appears to be some sort of an event that's not isolated to a single uh, commodity or something of that nature. 
I'll just tell a quick story because uh, Marty had a conference in uh, October. About Octo I put this off the top of my head. The dates were like October 17th and 18th on 1987. And go to the con uh, conference and Marty, Marty says, oh, by the way, there's going to be a crash on Monday. Of course, it did crash on Monday. But thankfully, he added the second part, which he said, you'll have a new high in about, I forget what it was, like 10 months within a year. So, uh, yeah, I just remember the way the room sank when he said, we'll crash on Monday. Uh, the tears. Marty, thank you so much for finding time. As always, we appreciate your insights. And I, again, remind people, you can just go, so much of this is uh, free on Marty's site, armstrongeconomics.com. He publishes way too much uh, uh, on a blog uh, every day, different geopolitical events, obviously financial events uh, directly. And again, a reminder, we have a special Canadian report. So go see Vicky over in the corner to get the 50% off code for that. I think you'll find it very worthwhile. Uh, in the meantime, Marty, thanks so much. Look forward to our next visit. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Mike.